right? I want to be able to welcome you for another of our health and preservation series with Dr. John Clark. We are looking at many marvelous themes, in fact, some themes that are uh, incredible that I believe that the Lord has in store for us. It's been a tremendous privilege and a pleasure these last few months to be able to study these uh, phenomenal truths with Dr. Clark. But before we begin, I'm going to invite Norma to be able to offer uh, our opening prayer and then I have a scripture to read and we'll do our theme song. Let's pray. Our kind Heavenly Father, we thank you Lord for this Sabbath day. Thank you for being with us and helping us and giving all the care and protection and good health. We pray that you'll be with us as we learn from Dr. Clark. Thank you for being with him and his family. We pray that your Holy Spirit will work, him, work through him, Lord, and as we learn from him, that we will be blessed and help to be uh, ready for your coming, Lord. We once again commit this program to your hands. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. You know, in Sabbath school today, uh, we were discussing about Micah chapter 6. I didn't have time to be able to pull it up as a slide for you to see, but hopefully you have your Bibles nearby and you can grab your Bibles so that you could be able to read along with me. I found it pretty interesting and we were reading a couple of verses into uh, our lesson and uh, Micah chapter 6 came up and I thought this was relevant for our study this evening as well. It says, Hear ye now, I'm reading from verse 1, what the Lord saith, Arise, contend thou before the mountains, and let the hills hear thy voice. Hear ye, O heavens, O mountains, the Lord's controversy, and ye strong foundations of the earth. For the Lord hath a controversy with his people, and he will plead with Israel. O my people, what have I done unto thee, and wherein have I wearied thee? Testify against me. For I brought thee up out of the land of Egypt, redeemed thee out of the house of servants, and I sent before thee Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. And you can continue to be able to read about what the Lord says in the rest of that particular chapter. But I found it interesting that if you were to be able to pay attention that the Lord calls for the mountains and the hills to bear testimony of what the Lord is willing to be able to do for us. What more could the Lord have done? He's given us the knowledge of his truths. He's given us his word, but we choose rather to be able to ignore this word. And we praise God for the privileges of these marvelous truths that the Lord has blessed us with as a people. The question is, what are we going to do with these truths? The Lord says, Where, what have I done to thee? Wherein have I wearied thee? If at all anything, we are the ones who weary the Lord with our impatience and our impertinences and our vacillating between truth and error and going back into the world. But the Lord says, I have redeemed thee, I have bought thee, and I have given thee servants. I have given you prophets, Moses, Miriam, and Aaron. And we have uh, the men of the Lord who are leading and guiding our understanding of truths that we have today. But at any rate, we want to be able to follow the words of the Lord that as is stated for us in Hosea chapter 4 and verse 6 that my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge it says because you have rejected knowledge I have rejected you from being my people so we want to be able to accept the word of the Lord we want to accept the counsels that are coming to us and not only just accept it intellectually but to be able to follow these words and make them practical in our homes practical in our lives right well let's do our theme song at this time and the song that we would like to be able to do today is a familiar song i believe it's create in me a clean heart oh god according to psalms chapter 51 verses 10 through 12. and hopefully you can see our screen Spirit within me, 
me not away from thy presence, O Lord, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and renew a right spirit within me. time to be able to lead us in our study today, spiritualistic practices in healthcare. Dr. Clark, thank you for being here and may the Lord continue to bless you and your family. Oh, thank you. God bless you too. And it's uh, good to be able to be here. I think you have to turn on screen sharing for me. Okay, Dr. Clark. All right, try that now, Dr. Clark. All right, how this goes here, and uh, let me just uh, get my. All right, now, do you see the screen there of my picture? My yes, sir. Okay, very good. And um, all right, maybe I'll say another word of prayer as we begin. Dear Father in heaven, we know that uh, your spirit and angels are here to minister and that you bless us with knowledge that we can become more acquainted with your ways and your will. Lord, as we share together on these topics of health, we pray that you'll be leading us and guiding us and giving us the wisdom we need to be better prepared to be your servants in the end time. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So we're talking about uh, spiritualistic practices in healthcare. And I have a text here from Psalms 127, verse 1. Accept the Lord build the house. They labor in vain that build it, except the Lord keep the city. The watchman waketh but in vain. That's a very interesting text. And I might add to that my own uh, extension of that. Except the Lord heal you, are you really healed at all? Except the Lord keep your immune system strong, are you really going to be able to fight a disease? Really, we're dependent upon God for everything, and uh, we want to keep that in mind at all times, because when we lose that dependence, then we are in trouble. Now, it so happened, um, well, I want to talk to you all as friends, as church family, as acquaintances, as people who want to know the truth. I'm going to talk about things that pertain to everybody's well-being. And uh, I'll, I'll say some things that uh, might make me unpopular. I mean, I've gotten some real flack over this talk before. You remember Jim Jones? Uh, if there were arsenic in the Kool-Aid, wouldn't you want to know about it so you wouldn't drink it, so your loved ones wouldn't drink it, so, so they wouldn't die? Wouldn't you want to know if there's something very dangerous? 
And that's what we're really talking about here is really very dangerous things. And, and so to start off, I want you to think about the king who was the king that followed Ahab. It was Ahab's son. Ahab was a very wicked king in Israel. Ahab was so wicked that, uh, you know, he had married Jezebel and uh, he, he killed prophets that uh, were prophets of the Lord. He'd like to have killed Elijah. But uh, he was a very wicked king, but his son followed in his footsteps. He did all the wickedness of his father and more. But one day he was walking through the palace and the palace uh, hadn't been well maintained and he fell through the lattice, the floorboards. And he suffered an injury, an injury that made him think, oh, I need to call for, well, I need to get healing. And so he decided to send off to Ekron. Now, kings, do they send off to novices? No, they send off to physicians or healers with a reputation. So obviously, Ekron must have had some kind of reputation. It was a reputation that uh, Ahaziah wanted to check in on and find out what was going to happen to his Feet. So he called two servants, trusted servants, servants that would go and carry, uh, you know, find out from Ekron, carry a message there and back. And, and he said, man, I want you to go to Ekron. And I want you to inquire and find out about my feet. Well, as those servants headed on their way, God had a different plan for those servants and for Ahaziah. God called Elijah, said, Elijah. Go and intercept these two men. Go and talk to them. But the angel of the Lord. You know, Ellen White often talked about the angel said, right? But the angel of the Lord. Uh, that's a very interesting thing to say, isn't it? But the angel of the Lord said to Elijah the Tishbite, arise. Go up and meet the messengers of the king of Samaria. And so he did. He headed off there. Well, the message wasn't too good. He said to those messengers, uh, guys, is it because there is no God in Israel that you go off to these other healers, to these other gods, to these other, well, physicians? Or, yeah. And he said, you turn around. You go back and tell that king that because he did this, he will die on his deathbed right where he is well as much as those two servants were trusted servants as much as they were on their way to to carry out the king's business they turned around and they went back to ahaziah when they got back to ahaziah he looks up and he says wow you're back soon and they sort of looked at each other well yeah we are kind of back soon aren't we and uh they said well uh, we met this, this, this man out there that said, go back and tell the king that, uh, well, is it because there's no God in Israel that you sent off to the God of Ekron? Uh, and he said, you're going to die on the bed here where you're laying. Well, the king was flabbergasted. <laughs> well, who was this? Well, we don't know. What did he look like? Well, he was this gentleman that uh, looked like such and so, and he was wearing a camel's hair Girtle, Ahaziah knew who that was. Oh, Elijah. Oh, Elijah had predicted the death of both of his parents. He had said that the dogs would lick their blood outside the palace there in Samaria. I mean, he knew Elijah, and now Elijah is saying he's going to die. Well, Ahaziah was not going to bow to the God of heaven. He wasn't going to let the God of heaven tell him where he's going to get his health care. Not one bit. And he was going to have his soldiers go and capture Elijah. So he told uh, his uh, army captain, send 50 men after Elijah. Where is he? Oh, he's out on this hill. So they, they went out there. They ordered him off the hill. Come down. Thou man of God. Well, Elijah said, well, if I be a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50 men. Did the fire come down? It sure did. 
and 50 men were turned to ashes. Ahaziah was not to be deterred. He sent a second 50 men. They came. They got burnt up as well. He sent a third, <laughs> a third group of 50 men. Well, this captain must have been somewhat uh, intelligent and uh, had a fear of God in him because when he came to that hill where Elijah was sitting, he bowed down and he, you know, oh, Elijah, you know, have mercy on me and on my 50 men. And, and so Elijah said, okay, I'll come with you because you are humble. He went with, went with this man, went back to the palace and gave the king the same message he'd given his two messengers. Is it because there is no God in Israel that you go and inquire of the God of Beelzebub at Ekron to check out about your feet? Because you've done this, you will die on your bed. Is this serious business? How serious is this business anyway? Well, we have good evidence. We, we, we know what the evidence is. You know, um, the Hebrews were the only nation favored with the knowledge of the true God. The only ones. And yet here they are going off to some other God. Aren't we as Adventists the only ones favored with the health message? And when the king of Israel sent to inquire of the pagan oracle, he proclaimed to the heathen that he had more confidence in their idols than in the God of his people, the creator of the heavens and the earth. Uh, you know, in the same manner, do those who profess to have a knowledge of God's word dishonor him when they turn from the source of strength and wisdom to ask help and counsel from the powers of darkness? This is from 5T196. If God's wrath was kindled by such a course on the part of a wicked, idolatrous king, how can he regard a similar course pursued by those who profess to be his servants? He won't be happy. That's for sure. And it's interesting in this same chapter in 5T on page 192, instead of humbling his heart before the Lord, so does that give you indica any indication as to what we should do when we're sick? Humble our hearts before the Lord. He, King Ahaziah, ventured upon the most daring act of impiety that marked his life. Wow. But, 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 but he was a Baal worshiper. But, but, but he was like his father and his mother. He's, he's uh, persecuting God's people. He's, he's uh, pagan, practically. And, and yet the most daring act of impiety that marks his life is going outside of God's people for his health care. That's right. He commanded his servants, go inquire of Beelzebub, the God of Ekron, whether I shall recover of this disease. What is the most daring act of impiety that marks your life? Have you been going to non-Christian healers for your health care? Or worse yet, Satan's healers? If any among you us are sick, let us not dishonor God by applying to earthly physicians, but apply to the God of Israel. If we follow his directions found in James 5, 14 and 15, the sick will be healed. God's promise cannot fail. Have faith in God and trust wholly in him, that when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, we shall appear with him in glory. You want to appear with God in glory? Then don't go to Ekron. Don't go to pagans. I mean, Ekron had a, a reputation. You think of John Harvey Kellogg. He had a reputation, and he had presidents, like President William Howard Taft came to Kellogg for health issues. It was a good decision. Kellogg earned his reputation. Presidents and kings choose winners. Ekron had a reputation, for sure. And so do the spiritualists that we're going to talk about in this talk. Ekron had a reputation. Your friends and neighbors are only going to recommend Ekron to you if they have some reason to believe it could be helpful. Maybe they have been there themselves. Why don't you go see so and so why don't you go see, see this alternative healer this one who's done wonders 
well, it's good to, you know, get some feedback on whether or not the doctor has a reputation as healing patients before you go see them. But you got to start with the law and the testimony. To the law and the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, if they're not Christian, you don't go there. If they don't, you know, if they're not following God's commandments, you're going to go to a non-commandment keeper, the God of heaven, in whose life, in, in whose hands is your life, in him we live, live and move and have our being, are you going to go to some non-Christian or non-believer or even somebody who believes false doctrines in order to find God's healing? How does God dispense his healing? Does, it do, does he do it through people with reputation but who are atheists or spiritualists or agnostics uh, or humanists? What is the God of Ekron today? Well, is it not because there's not a God in Israel that you go to inquire of them? What does a true physician do? Doesn't a true physician link you up with the great physician, with Jesus Christ, with the God of the universe, with your creator to get your healing? Doesn't he administer these things to you so you can get better? Does our heavenly father love us? And is he willing to heal us? Do not all healings belong unto the Lord our God. When sickness is the result of their transgression, the patient, of the laws of life or laws, the natural law, they brought it on themselves, in other words. They do not seek to correct their errors. It's like smoking and, and thinking you're going to get over lung cancer. And then ask the blessing of God, but they resort to the physicians. So the physician then becomes a false gospel. So I can continue to live in sin. Sin is violation of the law. Violation of the laws of your being are just as much sin as violation of the moral law. And so false gospel says you can keep on sinning and you can get better. I've got this pill for you. If they recover health, they give to drugs, the pills and doctors, all the honor, the worship. So who you turn to in time of sickness shows who you worship. It's a matter of worship, isn't it? In the end time, isn't it a matter of worship? Isn't that the first angel's message? Worship him that made the heaven and the earth and well, worship the creator. And what does the creator say? The creator keeps you alive every second. You think he wants you to go off to Ekron to get healed? Are we deists? We think God wound this thing up and he's just going to leave it go. Who do you turn to when you need healing? Who we trust for healing is who we honor or essentially worship. We either turn to God or we turn to the adversary. There's only two options. Choose you this day. Choose you this day. Whom you'll serve. Who are we worshiping? Ekron or are we worshiping God? That's the choice. We don't have any other choices. There's no, you know, we're told that everybody in this world, I could bring you up the quote, but I'm just going to paraphrase it here. Everyone in this world is either under the control of good angels or evil angels. There are no independent scientists out there who have the truth from some scientific technique that are not under either the control of good angels or evil angels. There are no physicians out there that are, that are just neutral, that are not under either the control of good angels or evil angels. There, and so you need to choose who you're going to get healed by evil angels or good angels. That's your choice. There's no middle ground. And there's no scientists out there producing scientific evidence that has not been under the control of either good angels or evil angels. God wants us to get our truth from him. There's only truth found in him. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Okay, so you say, but I have this terrible problem. The king had this terrible problem. I'm looking for a miracle. Are you looking for a miracle in your life? Well, let's read about it. Because we need miracles, natural means, used in accordance with God's will, bring about supernatural results. Your heavenly father wants to heal you. He heals through obedience to his wonderful laws of nature. Are you willing for Jesus to be your personal savior from disease? And what are these natural means? I've had some discussion with some friends of mine on this physicians. 
One of them wrote me, they wanted to ask, well, Dr. Clark, what do you think about using IV vitamin C for treating cancer? And I wrote back, sort of tongue in cheek, I said, well, I say, don't do this at home. And he wrote back, said, I, I, get, your, I get your drift. It isn't a simple natural remedy, is it? It's not a simple natural remedy. God works through natural means, simple remedies. And, uh, and when they're used in accordance with his will, under his direction, and in asking for his spirit to heal the infirmity, then if he chooses, they can bring about supernatural results. Do you think artificial means could bring about supernatural results? I mean, do natural means in and of themselves bring about supernatural results? Only with the blessing of God. Like you remember Naaman, God said, go dip seven times. Did he dip seven times? Yes. Was he healed? Yes. Modern science would say, oh, let's go to that water, get a little bit of it, test it, see what kind of fancy things are in there, and let's make a pill out of it. The seven dip cure pill. It'll cure leprosy. And so everybody can take the seven dip cure pill and it'll cure leprosy. Is that simple natural means? No, that's laboratory concoctions. That's synthetic means. That's uh, not, and why doesn't it work? Because it's not done of faith. We ask for a miracle and the Lord directs the mind to some, fill in the blank. No, you can read it there, simple remedy. God works through simple remedies and he brings about miracles. You need a miracle? Ask him. He can tell you. I had one lady. She said, my blood sugars were going up and I knew it was a problem. What do I do? What shall I do? So she prayed to the Lord. She didn't want to go to talk to a doctor and get insulin and pills. She said, Lord, what do I do? The Lord said, go out to your front yard, pick some leaves off the tree over there just by the fence. Take those leaves and blow them in water and make a tea out of them and uh, drink that and that'll help your blood sugars she did it it worked then she asked people what tree is that it was a lemon tree does science bear that out yes there's been some good science that bears that out but i don't need good science to bear that out i've got the lord but yes the science does bear that out and yes lemons lemon leaves boiled and it gives you something that helps inhibit the uh, metabolism of carbohydrate and so your blood sugars don't go up so high. It worked, but God told her. She didn't have to read a scientific article to get that. Well, it's nice to have some evidence once in a while, and we'll get into that here. But uh, again, the scientists are either under the control of either evil angels or good angels too. We ask to be kept from the pestilence that walketh in darkness, such as COVID, that is stalking with such power through the world. We are then to cooperate with God, observing the laws of health and life. Do those laws include vaccination? I think not. We cannot expect the Lord to work a miracle for us while we neglect the simple remedies he has provided for our use, which aptly and opportunely applied will bring about a miraculous uh, result. You want a miraculous result? Learn to use these natural remedies apply them aptly, apply them opportunely when there's opportunity, and the Lord will bless if you ask him to be the one to heal and he gets the glory and the worship for healing. Well, who is this Ekron? Ekron appears in the Bible and other places. Remember Eli and his sons? And when they took the ark out into battle, that it was captured by the Philistines, where was it taken? It was taken to Ekron. What happened to Ekron? Well, this wonderful healing center didn't heal. They had trouble. They got enrods or tumors in their private parts. That's not particularly fashionable for a um, fertility cult that they were. And so, well, they knew they were in trouble. Whatever their methods of healing, they were not the methods of the Heavenly Father. Their methods were idolatry, mysticism, clairvoyance, chicken liver dust, spiritualism, necromancy, witchcraft, witch doctors, idols, healing shrines. No scientific method here, just mysticism, 
the power from beneath? Oh, somebody might say, oh, they know something nobody else understands. Oh, you scientific doctors just don't know what the Chinese have been tapping into for thousands of years or Arduvic medicine over in India. Well, brethren, protect your friends and family. There are very subtle dangers, dangers in going to Ekron. You don't want to go there. Mysticism is not the answer. And so, verse 4, Now therefore thus saith the Lord, Thou shalt not come down from the bed on which thou art gone up, but thou shalt surely die. You think Satan would have been happy to keep him alive? Oh, sure. <laughs> well, but he wasn't given that opportunity. Surely die. Except the Lord heal you. Are you really healed? You know, we're told that Satan can make you sick and then he can make you well again. But is that the kind of well you want to be? Oh, my mother was in terrible pain, somebody says. And the witch doctors made her happy as a lark. <clears throat> she went to the spiritualistic healer and she's all better now. Who do you really want to be? your healer or the healer of your loved ones who who do you want to be your healer if god chooses not to heal you or you do not like his method of healing are you going to go to ekron what if god says you have to do four months of hot and cold treatments are you going to go to ekron and try to get something that'll fix you quickly Exodus 15, 26 says, God wants to be, be your healer. For I am, that's a very important name, right? I am the self-existent one. For I am the Lord that healeth thee. And if he isn't the one that heals you, you're in trouble. Who are these gods of Ekron today? Who are using these mysticisms? Whoever, other than God, who takes the credit or glory to themselves for healing is one of these gods of Ekron. Mystics. Um, you know, magic touch. Fancy healing machines. Special water machines. Magic potions. Special nutraceuticals. Super supplements. Miracle drugs. Magic exercises. Yoga type things. You know, all this. I mean. People have all, reflexologists, well, well I got to tell you a story. I had a lady who had uh, breast cancer, and because she had breast cancer, she was serious about her health. She came to me. She says, Dr. Clark, I want to do natural things. I want to do natural things to take care of my health. I want to get over this with natural remedies. What shall I do? I set her up with a program, good food, good herbal teas, good uh, hydrotherapy treatments, including fever baths. And so she started doing it, fever baths, good food. Then I called her up in a couple of weeks and I said, how are you doing? How, how's it going? Uh, oh, um, um, I have been unable to do my fever treatments due to a heart problem. I said, you have a heart problem? Where did you pick up a heart problem? I thought you were all healthy and well. Uh, you didn't tell me about a heart problem problem before, and I believe I asked you about that. Well, I know, I know, but, but I have a, a heart problem. And a wave of fear and worry and foreboding rushed over me as I'm thinking, this lady's going to die. She can't do her fever treatment. She can't do her hydrotherapy. She's got a heart problem, but, well, you know, you can't go to Ekron without the devil noticing. You may even pick up a few demons along the way. So I asked her, how, how did you know you had a heart problem? Well, well, how did this come about? Well, I went to church and the, the church ladies told me, you know, there's this, there's this lady down in, in this other Adventist church that's coming to our health cooking classes. And, uh, and, uh, and, and she's, she, she can look at your feet and, and she can pull toxins out of your feet and she can examine your feet and tell you things about, about your health and things you can do and 
We think you should go see her. So my patient went down to the reflexologist and she stuck her feet in this bath and whatever. And uh, then the lady went to pushing around on her feet and pushed on some point and said, uh, does that hurt? And, and, and our patient said, yeah, yeah, that hurts. And, and the lady said, oh, have you ever had a heart problem? And uh, she says, well, no, no, I haven't. And, and she says, oh, you better get your heart checked out because, you know, this point here is sore and that means you have a heart problem. And, uh, and so, well, so she could read everything through her feet and fix everything through her feet, huh? And so our, our lady said, well, I'll go see my, my doctor. And, and went and saw her doctor and did a treadmill test and found something wrong with her heart and said, you can't do those hot baths anymore because you got a heart problem. I said, no, wait a minute. You told me before you didn't have a heart problem. Well, that's right. And had you been checked out? Yes, three weeks ago, I was checked out by the doctor. And I didn't have a heart pro problem. And so I said, now you went down to this, this spiritualist. She did this clairvoyance on your feet. And, uh, I, and now you have a heart problem. And she says, yeah, wh why do you think that is? I says, either you're very suggestible or you picked up a demon down there at that reflexologist. And, uh, and so you need to confess, repent, and get back to your natural remedies uh, that, uh, you know, we, we prayed about and, and talked to the Lord about and set you up that the Lord approves of and that he can bless. And so she did. And she did repent. And she did get back to doing her fever treatments. You know, there's others out there that are clairvoyance, clairvoyance that you know, the, the reflexologist read your feet like the palm reader down, you know, the gypsy palm reader down here that can tell you all your life story. Uh, there's the iridologist. They look in your eyes. They look in the back of your eye. And, well, and they, they say they can read your, your, read all kinds of things. And then there's those people that look at your back. You know, friends, beware of the palm readers. Beware of walking on Satan's ground. The question I have for you is this. Have you picked up any evil spirits by going to Endor or Ekron? Remember, Endor is where the witch was that told Saul he was going to die. Now, look at this picture we have on the screen. And there's this man sitting there in a yoga position. But somebody has painted seven dots on his spine, or at least on his axis of his body. One starting the top of his head, one in the middle of his forehead, one on his neck, one in his middle of his chest, and then three down his lumbar spine. We call these the seven chakras of spinal energy. That's total mysticism. The way it works is the great power of the universe comes shooting out of heaven and comes down to your spine, and it needs to go out through all your nerves uh, through seven chakras of spinal energy, and if any of these get plugged, you get diseases, anything from musculoskeletal diseases to chronic, I mean, this is their theory. I'm just telling you what their theory is. And this is what they work on. This is the way they try to analyze if you have disease. And the way they fix it is they have to unplug those channels of spinal energy. They do it through needles, uh, such as um, pins, you know, acupuncture, uh, or, you know, there's other things they'll do to figure these things out. Um, there's hypnotism, you know, it's very interesting. I was talking to an Adventist pastor and, um, uh, he said, yeah, I went to the dentist up in Iowa. You know, Iowa is the birthplace of a lot of spiritualistic healing. That's why I mentioned that. He went up to Iowa and the dentist said, well, I can either take this big, sharp needle that's full of uh, stinging medicine and shoot it into your jaw and you'll have no pain. Or I can just do a quick little move here and you will be free from uh, pain and I can do this dental procedure without you having to have this needle. Well, the Adventist pastor, not thinking clearly about all this and knowing the spiritual roots of this said, okay, do the quick little thing. 
And he said the uh, dentist uh, flipped his jaw this way and that way and slapped him on the side of the head all of a sudden. And the pain was all gone. Wow, interesting. What he had done is he used the technique of sudden hypnotism. You can look up sudden hypnotism on the internet. I've got a link there actually uh, below that uh, paragraph that I just put up. And here's what the paragraph says. Once you understand the principles behind instant uh, hypnosis, you will be able to do rapid induction, induction hypnosis based on any kind of sudden movement. Fascinating. So, again, either evil angels or the angels of God are controlling the human mind. Friends, is it your loving Heavenly Father, the Creator, God, that is in control of your mind? And what about this whole business of... Uh, Acupuncture, well, it's just another way of unclogging these chakras of spinal energy. That's the theory behind it. It's more spiritual. If you want a really good book on it, you want to go and get Edwin A. Noyes' book. He's an Adventist physician, and he's written this whole book on spiritualistic practices in healing. And uh, his website is spiritualisticpractices.com. And you can find out all about these things and uh, some of the results. Um, now, I would be remiss today if I failed to warn you of your danger from a very popular god of Ekron, for it is also a very dangerous healing profession, and that is, well, something that I learned from my wife. We were newly married, and one day she says, oh, my neck is bothering me. I wish I could see a good uh, chiropractor. Well, I was not very aware of them. I mean, I knew about them. Oh, I mean, they, the town was, where I lived was full of them because chiropractic started in Iowa. There were more chiropractors than there were physicians. Not that that's significant, but I'm just saying there was a lot of them. And one of them had carpal tunnel and was my patient. So I had a patient that was a chiropractor. <laughs> and uh, I'd heard about chiropractic in medical school class. They basically said they weren't very scientific. They had a very good lobby, so they covered themselves well. And uh, that they used a lot of suggestive uh, uh, talk to make their patients feel better. Uh, that their diagnoses weren't well-founded in science, but they didn't really get into it much with us as far as some of their actual dangers. And so I told my wife, well, I have a patient that's a chiropractor, turnabout's fair play. Why don't I take you to him since you say you've been used to seeing chiropractors in the past and you sort of sold on them. And uh, I didn't realize the danger. But so I took her to the chiropractor and I watched, he said, oh, you know, come and watch what I do. And at the end of his uh, treatment session, I was uh, thinking, well, this is a dog and pony show, but what was really going on? Well, how about, let's start with the scientific method. Um, so the chiropractor took uh, my wife and put her on a tip table and measured her legs and said one was shorter than the other. Okay, well, that's novel. And uh, there's been some good studies done on this. They'll take a patient to the chiropractor, get a diagnosis, turn around and take uh, this uh, same uh, patient and put them through a CT scanner and demonstrate that no such uh, Diagnoses can be demonstrated anatomically on, uh, uh, you know, radiological imaging. Chiropractic theory has failed tests of both validity and reliability. So their diagnoses don't exist. So their treatments are not treating any legitimate disease. The subluxation, which is the foundation of its theory, has never been demonstrated to exist. Moreover, anatomist. Edmund uh, 
Creelan, PhD, twisted cadaver spines and found that nerves were not impinged as chiropractors postulate. It's not true. In practice, when I was practicing, which my practice was orthopedic surgery, I would have patients sent to me, young men who wanted to join the army, but who had gotten funny diagnoses from a chiropractic standpoint, and they needed to be cleared by me so they could join the military. And so I would check, they would have diagnoses like you had a rib subluxed or a spine subluxed or some joint subluxed, and I would send them for a radiological study and no, they didn't have any of that kind of thing. And yes, you're free to, you know, go join the army. And so I realized that whatever was coming out of the chiropractic camp was not uh, verifiable on any objective tests such as imaging. Another thing that I'd come across was in my residency uh, as orthopedics, we dealt with spine. We ended up taking care of patients that had been damaged by chiropractors. Uh, a survey from Stanford University Stroke Center found that within a two year period, 56 strokes had occurred among patients within 24 hours after receiving neck manipulations by chiropractic doctors. One patient died and 86% were left with permanent impairment. We had, I had a patient that uh, had, uh, had been paralyzed by a chiropractor through a neck manipulation. Also had another patient who had a back injury from a chiropractor. Most cases involved uh, intervertebral artery damage. The age range of the patients affected was anywhere from 21 to 60 years with most occurring in young individuals. Very interesting. Uh, had one patient who, after they had their neck manipulated, they developed Parkinson's disease as a result of blood flow changes to their brain, especially the back of their brain. And, but you know, we might say, yeah, well, you know, there's things go wrong for, 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 for allopathic doctors too. And, and, and other professions, and, and so it is. And, and yes, you know, maybe we can expect that this was just a funny thing, but I'm gonna go beyond the scientific method and yeah, a few bad cases. That's not what we're talking about here. Our talk here is about the God of Ekron, talking about spiritualism and talking about the roots of this all. So let's go on and look at this a little closer. And once my wife went to this guy and he did this song and dance and what I call a dog and pony show where he checked her leg lengths and tipped her on this table and did all kinds of, um, well, interesting things with different uh, tools that uh, uh, looked like something I would use in the metalworking shop. Um, I did my own research. I went to the internet and I typed in her search. The first search hit that came up was an academic chiropractor by the name of Simon Sazon. And he was uh, talking about the history of chiropractic. And he was sharing the first chapters in the book he was writing on this. He was a teacher of chiropractors, an academic chiropractor. And he was very proud of the roots of chiropractic. He talked about the originator of uh, chiropractic, David Palmer, Daniel David Palmer. And uh, he talked about the, the course of its history, that chiropractic started in 1895. And uh, David, uh, D. Pa uh, Daniel David Palmer uh, lived from 1845 to 1913. Um, he talked about how Palmer had devoted himself to study and had been reading books on esoteric healing, that's healing from the devil, from spiritualism, that he had been studying spiritualism since 1871, that he was a magnetic healer, and uh, that he was involved in uh, spiritualism, in mesmerism, um, in hypnosis, in clairvoyance. Spiritualism was the major influence on Palmer which was in vogue at the time. Spiritualism was a belief system that uh, focused on the ability to communicate with spirits, uh, often in the afterlife or just plain communicate with spirits. Um, 
And so the chapter that I've been covering in 5T, uh, 191 and following, is entitled, Shall We Consult Spiritualistic Physicians? We are warned about magnetic healers in that chapter. We're warned about clairvoyance in that chapter. We're warned about spiritualistics, spiritualistic physicians in that chapter. We're warned about the healing arts in that chapter. And it's a very detailed chapter, and you should read it. But uh, that chapter could just as well be straight about chiropractic. When they find somebody that have, that have a supposed subluxation, their adjustments come straight out of the book of instant hypnosis that I read to you earlier uh, from my research on instant hypnosis on the internet. When they crack your back, there's nothing physiological about taking somebody with a sore back and cracking their back that's going to fix that back. It's like, you know, uh, having a sore foot and beating it with a stick. It's not the way you heal something. And people who have a lifetime of back pain will claim to be healed by one quick move. They weren't healed by anything physiological. They were healed by something else. And so by his own account in Dee Dee Palmer's own textbook, um, on page 1112, we see, by his own account, Palmer was an active spiritualist and apparently believed that the idea of replacing displaced vertebra for the relief of human ills came in a spiritualistic seance through communication with the spirit of a dead doctor, Dr. Jim Atkinson, a physician who had died 50 years earlier in Davenport, Iowa. How many here, when they get sick, go to a seance to figure out what to do to fix the problem? A bit shocking, huh? If in order to be healed by God, I need to go where Satan has led the way, whose healing ability needs to be questioned, Satan's or God's? God is not looking to where Satan has led the way for your healing. God does not need you to be healed in that way. He just doesn't need that, and you don't need that either. And so the same chiropractic uh, historian, looking at some of his comments, Palmer was attracted to both spiritualism and then mesmerism. That's hypnosis. That's those sudden movements that cause you to have your frontal lobe shut down and an evil spirit can come in and do things to you, both of which fit his spiritualistic beliefs. Uh, mesmerism is hypnosis and control of the human mind by someone other than God. Through the channel of phrenology, we're reading here in Signs of Times, psychology and mesmerism, that's that hypnotism, he, Satan, comes more directly to the people of this generation. So how is he doing this? Through chiropractic. And works with that power, which is to characterize his efforts near the close of probation. Are we near the close of probation? You know, we might be after the close of probation. Remember Noah, when probation closed and the door of the ark was closed, nothing happened for seven days. And we're told it'll be the same in the end as well. And uh, it'll happen sometime. But yes, we're near the close of probation. You think that uh, this type of healing is going to be more active? Well, if you believe anything about what God tells us, you will know that. Yes. So Palmer wrote a letter in which he was defending his new profession. A letter written by Palmer in 1911 reveals that Palmer started chiropractic not as a healing art, but as a religion, and the religion was a form of spiritualism. So when you go to a chiropractor, you're going to a high priest of this religion. And so you can end up picking up a demon, just like my breast cancer patient picked up when she went to see a clairvoyant healer. And so we have all these interesting depictions that go along with chiropractic. But I'm going to lay over some text here that we can read. Chiropractors are limited. And I'm reading from uh, another author here, which is actually uh, a teacher at Loma Linda when I was there. Chiropractors are limited to analyzing and manipulating the back. They have limits. In other words, he's, he's saying. But this is no limit at all if you accept the chiropractic paradigm, which holds that nerve energy is a metaphysical entity 
that travels from out of the cosmos into the mind, down through the spine, and into every organ in the body, and that chiropractors can detect interferences with that cosmic energy flow and restore power, full power through manipulations or other methods. So they think they can heal anything because everything in your body that gets sick is a result of this problem. Chiropractors allege that virtually all health problems may be affected by their adjustments, which I've shown you are sudden hypnotism or instant hypnotism. They also assert that they can treat any condition that may benefit from improving the flow of an alleged cosmic energy that emanates either from the throne of God or the nucleus of the Big Bang, depending on one's fundamental beliefs. Yes. Folks, if there are impediments to you and your family or your friends receiving life, physical or spiritual from God, do you believe a chiropractor is going to be able to fix that problem? If you want life from God, you want to be there to get it directly from him, not through a channel Satan has instituted by a seance. I, a while back, I met a young man. Uh, we were together at a place learning, uh, learning uh, organic agriculture. And this, this, this person had, uh, had been a student for two years at a chiropractic school. And he only had three years to, you know, it was a total of three-year program. He had done two years and he was compelled to leave because it was so spiritualistic. He realized that he was in trouble and that he had to get out of there. And so student loans and whatever, he left and he came to learn agriculture. He was wise enough to step out of the problem. And so very interesting. Chiropractors are clairvoyants of the spine. They read health conditions by what they find in your spine, just like the reflexologist reads it in your feet or a palm reader reads it in your hand or an iridologist reads it in your eye. That's a clairvoyant. Who use the techniques of instant hypnotism, i.e. adjustments, instead of needles as the acupuncturists do to allegedly unclog the channels of spinal energy, the seven chakras that are clogged up. That's what they do. And so, you know, you may not see a picture in their office like the one on the left, uh, but you may, but you may see a picture like the one on the right. It's been sanitized, but look, there's still seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven chakras there of spinal energy. And now they've tried to make it scientific by putting all kinds of things that can go wrong if that thing gets plugged up. This is not good. This is going off to Ekron. Those who give themselves up to the sorcery of Satan may boast great benefits received thereby. Oh, no one was able to heal me was a chiropractor. But does this prove their course to be wise or safe? What if life should be prolonged? You live longer as a result of it. What if temporary gain should be secured? Wow. I mean, the pain's gone. Well, isn't that the you know, the proof of the pudding? Uh, will it pay in the end to disregard the will of God? All such apparent gain will prove at last an irrecoverable loss. You can't go back. We cannot with impunity break down a single barrier which God has erected to guard his people from Satan's power. Don't do it. Our only safety is in preserving the ancient landmarks to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word is because there's no light in them. Stay as far away from the rattlesnake as you can. Don't play with his venom. Don't play with his tail. So the chapter's name is, Shall We Consult Spiritualistic Physicians? That's the name of the chapter. And, uh, and people will say, but, 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 but no one else was able to heal me. Friends, I want to guard you and your family from a particularly ominous danger. 
If I did not care about you, I would not risk becoming unpopular with you. The mother watching by the sick bed of her child exclaims, this is in that chapter, I can do no more. Is there no physician who has power to restore my child? She is told of the wonderful cures performed by some clairvoyant or magnetic healer, a chiropractor. And she trusts her dear one to his charge, placing it as verily in the hands of Satan as if he were standing by her side. Now, this is the very ominous thing in many instances. In many instances, the future life of the child is controlled by a satanic power, which it seems impossible to break. Once you're healed by Satan, you could be well be under the control of Satan. Don't drink the Kool-Aid. I was told about a lady who went to one of these healers. She was in a wheelchair. She had back pain. This healer did something that resolved her back pain pretty instantly. She walked out of the experience never to be in a wheelchair. Well, she walked home. Miracle of miracles. But she lost all spiritual interest. It began to bother her. She didn't like reading her Bible. She couldn't, she couldn't find hope and help from the word of God. She was, you know, and after some time, she went to the Lord in prayer and said, Lord, I've lost my spiritual interest. If this healing was not from you, then please give me back my back pain and give me back my spiritual interest. She returned to her wheelchair. She returned to her back pain, but she got back her spiritual interest. You don't want to be controlled by a power which it seems impossible to break. And so James talks about how to be healed. Confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Interesting, isn't it? There's no separating the healing from salvation, from spiritual things. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much, 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 much. Many of you may be feeling convicted today that knowingly or unknowingly, you have been beating a path to Ekron. What if I have placed myself in the hands of one such healer that is not clearly on the Lord's side? One who uses the techniques of Satan. We need to sincerely repent of the path we have beaten to Ekron. We need to purify our hearts and cleanse our hands. We need to ask God's forgiveness and for his abundant cleansing and pardon and protection. It is only in obedience that God can protect us. We need to renew our commitment to God as our healer and use only his safe methods of healing. We need to recommit to serve God and him only. And so we need to pray. So really, today, we've thrown a huge firebrand into the camp of the enemy, and he comes out yelling and screaming. You know, I've, I've, I've given this talk and shared it with even some chiropractors. Some have said, you know, we didn't know that. We've been mistaken. They repented. I've had other chiropractors that persecuted me and deplatformed me off of the internet, off of YouTube channels. You know, sometimes we're like Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. Are you going to be among those who say with the supporters of Korah, when he died, you have killed the people of the Lord? They said that to Moses. Or are you going to rejoice that the walls of Jericho are falling down? I, uh, I think about Hezekiah. Remember Hezekiah? Hezekiah was about to die. He had a boil, very poisonous boil, or at least infected boil. And the boil was uh, sapping his life forces. God told Isaiah, go talk to Hezekiah. Tell Hezekiah he's going to die. Put his house in order. He's going to die. 
Wouldn't you like to know when you're going to die? And that you can put your house in order? Wouldn't that be nice? Yes. I mean, that's like a promise of eternal life right there. Was Hezekiah happy? No. He turned his face to the wall. He said, oh, God, I've been a good boy. I've done all these wonderful things. You can't let me go now. Don't do this to me. Don't let me die. And so God sent Isaiah back. Remember, he was even just walking out the door and God said, go back. And so Isaiah went back and gave Hezekiah some options. You can either have the sundial turn forward or back and, you know, give you 15 years. Well, so he got 15 years. God said, okay, I told you you're going to die, but I'm going to give you 15 years. What did that? Hezekiah do with that 15 years? Well, Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign, so that wasn't a good thing because he must have been born a couple years after that. And he sold him out to the Babylonians. Remember, he, sold, he, told the, he showed the Babylonians all his treasury. The Babylonians came back to get it. Well, I guess the point there is if God says it's time for you to die, you don't want to get healed. You don't want to be kept alive. Hezekiah didn't know when to die, I guess. And other people, they, are, they want life at all costs, even if they have to go to Ekron. And remember, I likened this not only to going to Ekron, but going to, to Endor. Let's suppose, for argument's sake, that the witch of Endor has a 100% healing rate at fixing, well, in this case, spine pain. You go to the witch of Endor, you'll be healed. No unhealed patients leave her office. You are assured of 100% healing. Does that make the witch of Endor God's gift of healing for you? Can you say after you got healed by the witch of Endor, praise God, I'm healed? Not likely. I mean, and what if the prophet Elijah only has a 10% healing rate? Or Elisha. And so, are you going to go to Elisha that only has a 10% healing rate? Or are you going to go to the Witch of Endor? What if the Witch of Endor goes off to medical school? She's still a witch, but she goes to medical school. She comes back from medical school. Now she's this so, so famous doctor. Are you going to go? Does that make her God's gift of healing for you now? Is God dependent upon, you know, witches for your healing, even if they go to medical school? How about if your next door neighbor, best friend, Seventh-day Adventist, goes off to witch doctor school, goes off to chiropractic school? Does that make them God's gift of healing for you? How about if the atheist next door goes off to oh-so-famous medical school and becomes the top doctor at some cancer research institute and you get breast cancer? Is God dependent upon some atheist for your healing? Or does God want you to go to a Seventh-day Adventist that went off to Seventh-day Adventist to natural remedy school that's taught according to his teaching, and they've gotten their instruction in things that God can use, natural means that can be used in accordance with his will and bring about supernatural result? We have these choices, that's for sure. In summary, God wants to be your healer. Do you want him to be your healer? He works through faith and simple natural remedies. And he wants to liberate you from sickness, sin, and death. Satan wants to be your healer. He works through mysticism, healing arts that entrap you, and by anything but God. Chiropractic is a profession started via a seance and started by Satan. Once healed by Satan, you could be forever entrapped in his power. Whose power do you want to be under? That's the question. All right, thank you, Dr. Clark. Uh, another powerful study. I have a couple of questions with regard to um, clairvoyance and hypnotic uh, methods of healing. Um, someone asks if cupping and 
uh, massages would be considered as mysticism. What was the first word? Cupping? I believe that's what it's C-U-P-P-I-N-G. Is that cupping or cupping? Right. Suction cups. Suction cups are coming from the uh, spiritualistic standpoint. If you get those suction cups and you read the literature that comes from it, it comes right out of mysticism. Massage is a mixed bag. It depends on your massage therapist. I've had a lot of massage therapists and even physical therapists who uh, like to try to uh, get over into chiropractic. They do uh, cranial sacral stuff. That's all part of spiritualism. They uh, do uh, healing touch, just sort of uh, non uh, uh, massaging touch that uh, doesn't really do anything for you except as it is being done through some uh, supernatural power. Uh, you have to find out, and, and again, you're so you want your massage therapist just like you want your doctor to be a, a, a practicer of, of the healing arts as ordained by God. You want them to be a Christian of your faith, you want them to be a consecrated vessel and uh, to pray over you and give God the glory. And, uh, but yes, there's, there are massage therapists that are good, that use nothing but massage and, uh, and massage helps to improve blood flow in tissues, to relax uh, tendons, nerves, muscles, uh, blood vessels, uh, ligaments for relieving pain. And so you can find a good massage therapist, but not every massage therapist is good. And a lot of massage therapy students that I've come across have complained that in their in their schooling these days, they had to learn spiritualism as part of their education. So there's some good uh, massage uh, therapy uh, schools and classes around and massage therapists, but uh, there's uh, a lot that have uh, come under Satan's power. Yeah, Dr. Clark, we, we know the the Far Eastern method of trying to be able to bring about supernatural healing by using Ayurvedic techniques and yoga and Reiki and meditation. Um, and I think you mentioned about those chakras to be able to bring relief. Yeah, definitely that comes from Far Eastern uh, methodology to be one with the earth. And that's very pantheistic in its approach. Of, of healing, which we know uh, started to be able to make inroads into the Adventist church with Kellogg. Uh, another question that, uh, that I have more or less would be with the use of homeopathic treatments. There have been a lot of uh, good Adventists that have gone down that road to think that homeopathic treatments are, the dilutions of homeopathy are something substantial for treatments that Ellen White did not say anything about, apparently, according to them. Would you care to be able to say something about that, Dr. Clark? Uh, the homeopathic uh, mode of operation, their uh, charter of practice, is that which would kill you in large doses or cause a symptom in large doses will heal you in small doses. Um, does that sound like natural means used in accordance with God's will bring about supernatural results? Not really. It sounds a bit uh, far-fetched. It's like, I remember when I was a kid, uh, the neighbor boys wanted to, uh, to joke with me and, uh, and say uh, that uh, if you went outside in the middle of winter, and I, I grew up in cold country, if you went outside in the middle of winter and it was freezing cold, like 40 below zero, and you had two buckets of water and one was cold water and one was hot water, if you threw them both up in the air, uh, the hot one would freeze faster than the cold one. Well, this was their theory. I mean, there's nothing, no foundation of that in science because, you know, you have a certain amount of heat and water and uh, you have to extract that heat before you can change it into ice. And the hotter it is, the more it's going to need to be extracted. And uh, uh, so it's a bit like that, you know, okay, that which creates disease or symptoms in high doses, fixes them in small doses. It's not scientific. I mean, it's not logical. It's not, uh, and uh, 
But that said, um, homeopathy, naturopathy, you can have spiritualistic things going on in those, both of them. But, uh, you know, some of these practitioners don't just follow the, that, that, that philosophy. Some of them actually use herbs. And so what you need to do is if they come up with something that's good, you need to check it out against uh, good uh, evidence-based medicine. So for me, I go and study a disease. If I want to look, I'll go look at some of these other practitioners and see if they use some herb to feed, treat that disease. And then I go to the white papers, go to Medline and look for any evidence from uh, evidence-based medicine to see if that particular herb or that particular um, uh, whatever will help that disease and it's been studied. And uh, so Ellen White did, uh, she chastised the doctor who were rejecting all natural remedies and kind of classifying them under homeopathy as a way of rejecting them, if I read her right. Um, and so she does mention the word homeopathic or homeopathy and some physician who was using natural remedies and, and, and sort of being ostracized because they called it homeopathy and rejected him when she was saying, you guys need to quit doing the allopathic thing with drugs and start looking into more natural things. She wasn't giving, you know, a carte blanche uh, endorsement of homeopathy, but she was giving an endorsement to using simple natural remedies and to taking the best that is, is good from what we could learn in, in that respect. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely, Dr. Clark. Uh, there was a question that came in with regard to Chinese medicine, whether that's considered a good approach for natural healing. Again, the Chinese use a lot of herbs. And so uh, I will look under perhaps uh, uh, something, look on the internet and see what the Chinese are using and then look for some good evidence for it. Um, I'll just give you an example. I had uh, a patient who had breast cancer and we were treating them uh, with natural remedies, fever treatments and everything else, charcoal poultices. And they said, well, my other friend who's in an Avena said, you should try, um, uh, let's see, castor oil packs. So I went looking for castor oil packs and I looked up castor oil. Well, first of all, Adventist pioneers rejected castor oil because it came from castor beans, which were known to be toxic and poisonous. But, you know, we don't go by the pioneers any, you know, we're not Catholic. We, we don't go by what all the pioneers say necessarily. We have to check them out too. But then I went and looked on the, the internet to see where this idea of using castor oil came from. And I found out it was Edward Casey, <laughs> a uh, spiritualistic false prophet that uh, really popularized it. But again, uh, I said, okay, but there's nothing necessarily wrong in and of itself with castor oil. So let me look at uh, Medline in the white papers and see if there is any documentable benefit or hazard to its use. And so I found that there was no, nobody saying that it was toxic or that in certain doses, you know, you're in trouble, but there was some papers showing that uh, castor oil had the ability, had the medicinal property of improving lymph drainage, lymph flow, the movement of the fluids in your tissues that's not in the blood vessels, but in the lymph vessels. And so I said, well, you know, uh, we always need to improve the drainage of lymph from tissues and sometimes breast uh, cancer patients have difficulties with the lymph drainage. And so, yes, there could be some practical application of, of uh, castor oil, not as a modality uh, recommended and touted by Edward Casey, um, not as, you know, a, 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 you know the, oil, the oil's been purified, so it doesn't have the toxins in it from the bean. And so I said, you know, it's, it's something that might be useful. Um, so the, the approach is to, first of all, make sure in and of itself, it has no, uh, bad characteristics such as hypnotism. You know, we wouldn't, 
we wouldn't find any way to justify hypnotism. We wouldn't find any way to justify using any tinctures with alcohol in them, for example. I think we did a whole talk previously on um, the, uh, how to identify a God-ordained healing method. And you could go back and look at that, uh, that talk to, to, to look at general principles like this. All right, Dr. Clark, thank you very much uh, for your time. Uh, just as an announcement, uh, we will be coming back to Health and its Preservation series on January the 15th. We're going to be taking a break for some time. Um, I want really appreciate your prayers and your continued support of uh, this ministry. We want to be able to praise God for Dr. Clark. Those of you who you know how to be able to reach Dr. Clark's website is rev14.com uh, where you can be able to receive enough and more of information plus you can watch uh, previous presentations on our channel as well Zoom International Prophecy School um, on YouTube that you could be able to get uh, like Dr. Clark was talking about the previous presentations uh, enough and information about the subjects that we have covered already. Uh, again, we want to be able to thank you, Dr. Clark, for being here. May the Lord bless you, your families, and uh, continue to be able to bless your ministry as well. Dr. Clark, if you can be able to close us out with a word of prayer, sir. Dear Father in heaven, we've talked about uh, a fairly touchy issue uh, when we're talking about uh, sometimes people's favorite uh, health care provider. And yet we've uh, given the truth on this matter and uh, the dangers of it. Lord, we don't want to be like Ahaziah going off to Ekron. We want to be uh, going uh, to your healers like Elisha and uh, to you and asking that you be our healer and that you be our God. And that uh, as we do so, that we can worship and praise you when we get healed. Lord, we pray that those people who have been going off to Ekron and have picked up a demon will be uh, aware of that, that they'll be repentant, that they'll be able to have your power and have this cast out and that uh, they can be blessed and that they can find healing in, healing in you if it's your will. Lord, each one of us has a life to live and a soul to save. And Lord, we pray that we will be ever looking to you as our savior and our healer. And we thank you in Jesus name. Amen. All right, thank you again for being here. May the Lord continue to be able to bless and keep you, your family, as you come to the end of this year, uh, that you would be able to make uh, decisions to be able to follow the Lord, follow on to be able to know Him, and make proper New Year resolutions with regard to your health. And uh, continue to be able to pray for the ministry of Dr. Clark and all of us who continue to support his cause and the cause of the gospel here. May the Lord bless and keep you, your homes, and your family.